there's an unmute somewhere, Mom. I don't. I can see you. Wait. Okay, guys. Um, let's get started. It's uh, 7:05. Um, happy Mother's Day, Rhode Island Beekeepers, and uh, many any potential other clubs that are joining us tonight. Um, it is May 9th. This is the general membership meeting of the Rhode Island Beekeepers Association. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Scott Langlis, and I am the current president. Um, so it's May 9th. Um, hopefully you guys made it outside today, this weekend. Yesterday was a little iffy, but today was actually a beautiful day. Um, you know, maybe got your inspections in, um, evaluated overwintered hives, maybe did a check on a package you guys installed last week or the week before, or just got your windware ready for the packages that you're going to be installing in the next upcoming weeks. Um, this can be kind of a, a challenging period. I mean, especially for overwintered hives. Um, you know, you're kind of in that funny spot of you're either dealing with, I had a dead out or I've got a busting colony that's ready to swarm. And I know we've already seen um, reports of colonies swarming around the verge of swarming. Um, if you haven't seen it already, uh, I posted a video maybe two weeks ago on the Rebo um, YouTube page on how to split a colony to hopefully mitigate swarming. Uh, if you guys will bear with me for a second, I will share that page here. Um, and these are just some, some good general, um, some good general links that you guys should have at, at your, uh, at your disposal here. Uh, the, the links themselves are actually really long and annoying to try to, you know, share with you guys. But if you go to YouTube and type in Rhode Island beekeepers, we have a dedicated page. There's a, you know, I try to keep these videos short, uh, short and to the point because like everything in beekeeping, there's like a million ways and a million options on how you can do things. But if you want to know how to split an overwintered hive, if you've never done it before, it's a good kind of quick introduction. Uh, and then if you have other questions, obviously feel free, post them on the Facebook page. You can email your mentor. Hopefully you have one. You can email, you know, any of the board members, you know, what have you, um, you know, we're here to help you guys learn. That's literally the main focus of, Reba. Um, yeah. But yeah, for those overwintered hives, especially if you did it, you did it successfully, this is going to be kind of the, the, now the crunch time. Um, you know, those bees, they don't just sit there and kind of twiddle their, their thumbs. Um, you know, they're in the process of growing and growing and growing and trying to expand their colony to split and form a new colony, aka swarming. Uh, you want to prevent that because, you know, obviously you want to keep the honey crop that you're going to lose when those bees go, you want to keep the production of that queen in the hive. And you also want to keep that, those bees out of your neighbor's chimney, out of their eaves. Um, you know, good, um, good bee husbandry is kind of part and parcel with being a good neighbor to your neighbors who didn't choose to have bees. Um, you know, obviously we are all drinking the Kool-Aid here. We, we think that having tens of thousands of flying sting insects in our yard is kind of the coolest thing we can do, but you know, your neighbors might not think that way. So you want to keep those bees in their boxes, keep them out of the trees, keep them out of your neighbor's yard as much as you can. Uh, so swarm prevention is going to be a good part of that. Um, so obviously part of that is you have to know when to split, you know, this, this, we, we, we get into the art versus science of beekeeping. Um, you know, there, there are numbers, there's science, there's biology involved, but there's a kind of an art to it. And especially for newer beekeepers, maybe this is just your second year, you have successfully overwintered hive. If you have, by the way, congratulations, because that's tough. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, my first year, I did not overwinter any hives. Uh, and it was a learning experience, it was a wake up call. But if you were lucky enough, uh, to overwinter your hives. Now you have to deal with that. And you're probably going to have some questions because this is a first time thing. Um, you know, you've gotten through the first year, you've gotten through feeding, building out home, you know, mite treatments, what have you. But now dealing with a really populous hive that's at the point of wanting to swarm is a new thing. So do you have a mentor? 
Uh, and I know we've been kind of singing this song to you guys for a while now. Uh, having a mentor we think is really important. Um, so there are lists on the REBA website, ribkeeper.org. Um, you know, maybe you also could just post on the Facebook page, you know, post what town you're in. Maybe you can find a mentor that way, but we've got a system set up now where you can just send in, you know, send a message to this list. Um, we have a county director in every county in Rhode Island. If you can't find a mentor, because we know it's a little difficult now that we're not having live meetings, you know, before we could have a live meeting and throughout the course of the event, you find out so-and-so is also in Burrowville, so-and-so is also in Warwick. Hey, I'm in Warwick. You know, do you want to come by, show me how to do something? You know, that's easy, but now it's a lot tougher. Um, so we've, we set up a system where we have a county director in every county. And if you haven't been able to kind of make that connection with a, a potential mentor, um, you know, you can just send a message to the county director. They'll assign someone to you. Um, you know, and if, if you have an issue, you know, if your mentor kind of goes, um, goes quiet on you for whatever reason, you don't get along with your mentor for whatever reason, your county director, is, she's, he or she is kind of like your shop steward. Um, you can take your issues to them. They can reassign you to someone else. But this is really a, a system to kind of link people up who don't know each other already. Um, now, I don't know, is Sarah on here? Um, and of course, I, I've got everybody muted. Uh, let me just do a quick scan through here. Yes, Sarah. Sarah, if you're there. Yes, I'm here. Um, do you want to do a quick um, plug on the Bee Buddies and upcoming uh, newbies meeting? Yes. Uh, so first off, um, the next new beekeeper meeting is going to be this coming Tuesday night, uh, 8 p.m. Um, so everybody that was on the email list through Bee School should have gotten an email. Um, I believe I sent it on uh, yesterday or Friday. I don't remember when. Um, so we're going to do that Tuesday night, 8 o'clock. Um, the Bee Buddies program um, is, is Lily's little brainchild project here um, that we, we work together on. Um, so as Scott was saying, like, we're not doing in-person meetings right now. And that really is the place where you make connections. You find out, you know, Hey, I'm in my third year. You're in your third year. You know, I'm looking to do splits or I'm looking to, uh, expand to six colonies. Oh, you already have six. You know, you can kind of chit chat about, you know, what, what does it take to do that? Um, you could find somebody that, um, uses Ross rounds or pollen traps, you know, some, some other more advanced techniques, but we don't have those in-person meetings right now. Um, so the Bee Buddies program um, is somewhat of a way then that people can make those connections. Um, so it was emailed out in the last uh, Reba email last week. Um, it basically is a Google sheet um, where you enter some information, um, but then you can also look and see who else is on there. So you can try to find somebody um, that's close to you um, or if, if you want, you know, if you're willing to travel or you want to meet online, um, you could try to find somebody, um, you know, that has similar, uh, experience with you, keeps the same number of hives. Um, uh, perhaps if you're looking to expand to eight colonies, so you could try to find somebody a couple of years in like you that already has eight colonies and you can kind of work with them to figure out, you know, how do I get there? You know, what is the commitment, you know, things like that. Um, you know, if you're looking uh, for information, as, as Scott was saying, on swarm prevention, you know, this is where you're in your second or third year, but maybe this is the first time you've overwintered. You can find somebody, um, you know, in second or third year who now has an overwintered hive and you're both kind of in that same place. So you can bounce ideas off of each other back and forth. Um, so it's, you know, of course, in-person meetings would be best, um, but this is kind of a, a substitute to help that along. Um, and we're hoping that you know it could continue into the future because um, not everybody can make those in-person meetings um, in the future when we can have them again. Um, but again, it's set up on a Google Sheet. The link is in the email. Um, it was only sent out to the Reba members. Um, we're not going to share it on Facebook or anything like that because we don't want um, our information basically plastered all over the internet. Um, so, and I think the long-term plan is is probably. Um, 
come next January or so, we'll clear out the list and we can start fresh and new. Um, if you want to take your name off the list at any time or you want to edit it or whatever, um, it, it's always available. Um, you know, so anybody can do that at any time. Um, you could add your name in two months. You could, you know, take it away in December yourself. Um, you know, that's up to you. Um, Lily, did you have anything else you want to add about it or, or um, any other ideas about it? Um, no, I think that covers it. We just want you to sign up and, and, um, and, and find a friend because it's much more fun to go in the hive with somebody else. And, um, you know, that's that I'm directing that to, to new people, but also to, you know, intermediate people too. It's just a lot, a lot more educational for you and more interesting to see different hives. And we're trying to make that as, you know, accessible as possible. It's not like you have to commit to this person or, uh, it's not like you have to be friends, ex except you will be because of B. So that that's all. Well, I think you covered it. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely not just for somebody in their second, third, or fourth year. I mean, definitely new beekeepers absolutely sign up. You know, connect with other new beekeepers. You know, it's just just making more connections is basically what it's about. That's all. Yeah. Thanks. Great. So for those of you who don't know Sarah Michelle, she didn't introduce herself, but she is our vice president. Uh, Lily also did not introduce herself, but she is the county director for Providence for our mentor program. Uh, and this, we really, I think we're looking at this not as a substitution for the mentor program, okay. but as a corollary okay. where your mentor is really going to be, yes. you've got a question um, that you don't know how to answer. Your mentor is going to be your go-to. Uh, the, the, the bee buddy thing is a little different. It's more just like, you can be two first year beekeepers who don't know the first thing about bees, but you live in the same town. Um, you know, obviously you're at the same level of inexperience. I'm going to do an inspection this week, come and do the inspection with me. I'm going to do my inspection next week, come do it with me. And it's a, a an accrual of knowledge that you get that way, where even if that person can't actually teach you um, you know, like from a position of authority, just by virtue of being there and experiencing that with them, you're going to learn so much. I mean, uh, you know, I've got friends up the street in North Providence. We joined Reba literally the same year. You know, at the time we were, you know, in our thirties. So we were like among the bottom five percentile age wise of people in the club at that point. Um, you know, we became friends. We're still, we're great friends today. And like, I remember like, maybe the second year we knew them, like he had all these swarms in his yard and I had never seen a swarm at that point. And he, you know, he, he called me up and, you know, my wife and I were out, you know, having lunch in the town and we ran over to his house and he's got all these swarms in the trees at his yard. And it was like such a cool experience that it wasn't a learning experience where he was like mentoring me or teaching me, but I was able to be there and experience that with him. And if, if we hadn't had that connection, like that wouldn't happen. And it was, you know, it was really cool. And uh, obviously anything you guys can do, if you have a, a second set of hands or a second set of eyes, it just makes it so much more easy and so much more fun. Um, I mean, I can tell you guys every, basically every bee operation I do out in the yard, Emily is with me. Like we do it, we're a pair, we're, you know, power couple, anything I can do, she can do anything she can do. Hopefully I can do. And we don't really do it, you know, alone um, because doing it alone, frankly, is not a lot of fun. It's twice as much work. Um, so if you don't have a partner, you know, in your own household who wants to do the kind of bee stuff with you, yeah, hopefully, you know, check out the Bee Buddy list and find someone in your town, you know, or one town over. Rhode Island, you know, I know nobody wants to drive one town over without packing a lunch because this is Rhode Island, but you can do it, uh, especially under COVID, you know, we've got a lot less opportunities for fun and enjoyment. So uh, let the bees kind of make those connections for you. Um, I've only got a couple more things to announce before we bring our guest on. If you haven't seen my announcement on the Facebook page, we do have shirts available. Uh, there's also, I believe, stainless steel water bottles, tote bags, and I think coffee mugs. Um, the link is on the Facebook page. We don't have it on the, on the website yet. Um, those orders are all, they're fulfilled through Teespring. They're not through Reba. So you order direct, they ship it directly to you. We're completely out of it. Um, 
and it is a new design this year. The old design is also available, but hopefully um, you guys like the new design. Uh, and then our next meeting is going to be June 10th, which mark your calendars is Thursday. So unlike our typical meetings, which are Sunday nights, this is a Thursday meeting uh, due to our speaker schedule. And I'm very happy to announce Dr. Sam Ramsey, at long last, the top of my wish list of guests, uh, Ed Szymanski, our program director, has got uh, Dr. Sam Ramsey lined up. For you guys who don't know, I mean, this he is a very young researcher. I believe he only you know, complete his PhD program within the last like maybe two to three years, but really kind of turned everything we know about varroa feeding habits kind of on their head. Um, just <laughs> such an inspiring story to hear this guy talk, because first of all, he's not only speaking from a position of knowledge and authority, but he's completely entertaining and engaging. Uh, and I've said this before, you could have your, your, friends and relatives tune into this meeting. If they know nothing about bees, they will be spellbound to hear him talk because it's such a great story and the way he tells it is, is just so compelling. Uh, so I really wanna impress upon you guys, listen to that meeting. It's June 10th, it's a Thursday night. Uh, and obviously we're gonna be flogging this to death because we wanna make sure you guys really get the, um, the benefit of Dr. Sam Ramsey. Um, with that, um, I'm gonna bring our, our featured guest. Uh, if you guys have questions, post them in the chat. Ed's going to take the questions at the end of the meeting, um, read them off. Uh, our guest today, a Rhode Island native. Um, you know, we, as you've heard me say in the past, we we have our kind of marquee guests who are the Tom Seeleys, um, you know, the Keith Delaplanes, like these high-end um, big ticket names. We've got a big ticket name and she's not, you know, from the West Coast. She's not from another country. She's a Rhode Islander. Uh, Dr. Rachel Bonoan, uh, Assistant Professor of Biology at Providence College. She has written for Bee Culture, American Bee Journal, Apidology, all these juried academic journals. Um, this is a real deal be researcher. She's from our own backyard. Um, and she's going to be talking to us today about the water preferences of honeybees. I, I know this is something that you probably all noticed uh, in your own yards. We talk about providing water sources. You guys put out this nice, beautiful, new uh, terracotta dish full of clean, sparkling Evian water, and your bees completely ignore it but they're all over the dog dish or they're all over your disgusting, unclean bird feeder. Uh, and there's a reason for that. And today our, our speaker, Dr. Rachel Bonoan is gonna tell us about that. So without further ado, Rachel. All right, I'm super excited to be here with you all tonight. Um, as Scott said, I am a Rhode Island native, just making sure I can share my screen here with you all. Um, I'll be talking to you about the research I did uh, for my PhD at Tufts University, so not too far north of here. Um, and I am back home in Rhode Island at Providence College, so I'm hoping to kind of build upon this research um, even more at Providence College once I get the okay to have bees on campus. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about my goals for honeybee research at Providence as well. Um, but before we get into my research, I just want to say happy Mother's Day to all the queen bees out there. Um, my mom and dad are here on this call, so happy Mother's Day to my mom as well. Um, benefits of virtual is I've gotten to share my research with family a lot more this year um, than in years past, so that's been a lot of fun. Um, so I am a beekeeper and an ecologist. I actually started keeping bees with observation hives at Tufts University. Um, I started with eight observation hives in 2012, um, and then I kind of moved my way up uh, to 15 Langstroth hives in my last year of my PhD program um, in 2017. Um, so I haven't actively kept bees since the end of my PhD, but I've continued going to meetings and mentoring beekeepers and being a part of bee schools um, in the Boston area. So I'm hoping to really get back into the beekeeping actively, um, but I still kind of kept my foot in the bee world. So this is actually one of my observation hives here. This is an exit tube. 
Um, this is what we called our bee hut or our bee shed. Um, so it's an exit tube of one of my observation hives. And it, this is not a giant beard. Um, it's actually a swarm and the queen was in the middle there. So we caught that swarm and we ended up with a little nuke in the back of our area. Um, and this day, this was the first, I had just gotten this new bee suit, which is why it looks so beautiful and clean. Um, so I was really excited to get that uh, <laughs> photo op when I had a clean suit that day. Um, so as I said, I am an ecologist. I went to grad school to study ecology and honeybees just ended up being a really great system for me to answer the types of questions I was interested in. Um, so you're all kind of ecologists. Um, which is the branch of biology that focuses on the relationships of organisms to one another in the environment. So you are all paying attention to your bees and paying attention to how they're interacting with what's around them. Um, I'm specifically interested in nutritional ecology, which is now a branch of ecology focused on how an organism's nutritional requirements, foraging behavior, foraging behavior and utilization of nutrients is linked to the environment. So again, you are all sort of nutritional ecologists, right? You're all watching what your bees bring back to the hive, if they have food, if they have water, um, which is why I really love speaking with beekeepers. Um, you are all such a great source of knowledge and data because you pay such close attention to your bees. And honeybees, like I said, not only are they awesome, right? I fell in love with the bees because I started studying them, um, but they're a really great system for studying nutritional ecology because of the way in which they collect food and how much we know about them. Um, so nutritional ecology is often quite difficult to study in organisms because you have to study both the organism as well as their food. And in the case of honeybees, we can actually observe them collecting their food. And we can also observe them bringing their food back to the hive, um, which is this, this really valuable source of data when we're studying nutritional ecology. So we don't have to go out into the fields and follow bees and look at what they eat. Um, we can just wait for them to bring their food back to the hive. We can sample pollen, we can sample nectar. Um, we can do all kinds of cool things within the hive, um, studying what the bees are actually collecting and what they're eating. Another really cool thing about nutritional ecology in the beehive is not only does the outside environment affect nutrition, but the inside environment does as well. Um, it affects what nutrients the bees need, um, depending on the time of year and all of the activities that they're doing. And even within the hive, bees of different ages require different nutrition. Um, so here we have a brood frame with lots of brood of different ages. So we have some fat grubs and some teeny tiny bees. Um, and even within this brood and the adults, different bees need different nutrients. So the older a bee gets, um, the less protein it needs because it's not developing anymore and the more carbohydrates it needs. So foragers, which are the oldest workers in the hive, they sustain themselves pretty much on just carbs um, because they just need the energy to fly and collect food. They're no longer developing and growing. So there's a lot of really cool questions we can dig into um, within the honeybee hive as well as outside the hive. And the really great part of studying nutritional ecology in honeybees is, like I said, beekeepers are fantastic uh, data collectors, data keepers. You pay attention to great details. And so we know what a healthy hive should look like. Um, and so we can track, you know, what the bees are eating and if that's actually, you know, making them stronger, healthier, or kind of not really helping them so much. Um, so in the spring, we have our hives getting ramped up. You know, there's not too much forage around. There's a lot of weedy things around that the bees might be able to get food from. Um, it sounds like some of you have some really, really great colonies ramping up right now and are doing some splits, um, which brings me to, you know, late spring, early summer. We have lots more forages for the bees. You might add more hot, more boxes um, if you're not splitting. We have a big active colony. And then in the fall, things wind down again. And so we know exactly what should be happening throughout the year, um, what the hive should look like on the inside, you know, healthy brood patterns, um, pollen, honey, nectar, all of those things. Um, and so this is just a really great system for the types of questions I'm interested in. And what's more is we know a lot about what honeybees eat. Um, so they collect pollen and nectar from flowers. 
pollen is the main source of proteins and lipids for honeybees. So it's kind of like the meat of their diet. Um, and there are some trace minerals in pollen. And then nectar is the main source of carbohydrates. So it's kind of like the potatoes of their diet. Um, and also nectar has some trace minerals. Um, honeybee nutrition is seasonally nutrient, uh, seasonally constrained just based on what's available, especially here in New England. So like I said, this time of year, things are starting to get ramped up. Um, but until right now, the only source of food really available for bees were any weeds that people let grow, right? So dandelions, clovers, um, I like to call them, we call them spontaneous forbs in my lab at school. So anything that kind of just grows out of your lawn unexpectedly is all that the bees really have early spring in New England. Um, nutrition is also spatially constrained. And so the bees that are used for these kind of commercial pollination services are forced to eat only one type of food for most of their life. Um, so here is an almond orchard, which is a complete monoculture, which means there is nothing but almond flowers um, providing pollen and nectar to these bees. And while honeybees can forage pretty far away from their hive, um, they can get up to 10 kilometers away from the hive. These almond orchards in California can get to be up to the size of our little state of Rhode Island. And while Rhode Island's a little state, that's a really big orchard with one type of flower um, for bees to collect food from. And so any bees kind of stuck in the middle of this are really only getting food or nutrition from one type of food, um, which as far as I'm concerned, probably isn't a good thing, right? Like even if you ate broccoli, which is really healthy, and that was the only thing you ate for your entire life, you wouldn't really be doing too, too great. You wouldn't be super healthy. And so I'm, I'm really interested in how quality and quantity and diversity of floral resources um, can affect honeybee health. But there's a third nutritional resource. I just talked a lot about pollen and nectar, so floral resources. But there's a third nutritional resource that you all have probably noticed your bees visit, as Scott was talking about. Um, and that's what I like to call dirty water. So dirty water, whether it be, you know, your bird bath, your swimming pool, your compost pile, a cow pie, um, dirty water has minerals in it as well. And so this is likely a third nutritional resource for your honeybees throughout the year. And I'll talk about the experiment I did to kind of dive into this a little bit more. So dirty water as a nutritional supplement is not unheard of um, in the animal kingdom, especially when we're thinking about insects. Um, so male butterflies do this thing called mud puddling. So they specifically visit mud puddles and that's to collect sodium. Ants in the tropics um, that live further away from the ocean will visit nutritional baits with sodium more often than those that live near the ocean. So presumably, the ants that are far away from the salty water are limited by salt and looking for it in their diet. Um, subterranean termites will preferentially nest um, in soil that is high in calcium and potassium. And sweat bees, this little green guy here, um, they're called sweat bees because of their preference um, of visiting livestock to lick their sweat, essentially. And we all know sweat is salty. So sweat bees get their name from a salt seeking behavior. And there's also this slightly horrifying study um, that came out of India on bees that drink human tears. So what these scientists actually did is they made themselves cry and then they sat outside kind of like holding their eyes open, waited for insects to land on their eyes, collected them and identified them. And most of the insects that landed on their eyes to drink their tears were teeny tiny bees. Um, so looking for salt in kind of strange places is not uncommon in the insect world. But what's super interesting to me is that no beekeeper, not no beekeeper, no scientist had really dived into this um, from a scientific standpoint, but beekeepers have noticed this for a really, really long time. Um, so this is kind of a ripe fruit for me to pick as a young researcher. I actually started this project my very first year of grad school. So based on what we know about honeybees visiting dirty water sources and insects 
you know, generally collecting dirty water as a way to supplement the minerals in their diet. So sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. I hypothesized that honeybees selectively forage in soil and water for minerals that their main floral diet may lack. So pollen and nectar do have trace minerals, um, but you know, when a beehive is super active, there's thousands and thousands of bees. Um, and so pollen and nectar might not have enough trace minerals to sustain a beehive. And so I have three predictions that I'll walk you through today. Um, one about the water, one about the floral resources, and one about the bees themselves. So you see these little icons um, in the top right corner of my slides when I'm talking about water, flowers, or bees. And the first prediction that I made is that honeybees, if this hypothesis is true, will show mineral preferences when foraging for water. So just like they prefer that dirty water over that clean water in your backyard, I hypothesize that they'll prefer water supplemented with sodium um, compared to water that has nothing in it. So deionized water um, is what we used for this experiment. My second prediction is that mineral preferences will differ with the distribution and abundance of floral resources. So here in New England, what I mean by that is just seasonality, right? So fall and spring have very different floral resources available for our bees. And fall tends to be the time in which there are fewer floral resources for them. Um, so I actually did this study in summer and fall um, over a couple of years in the Boston area um, at Tufts University. And then the third prediction is, presumably, if the bees are foraging in soil and water for the minerals that their flowers lack, there's an optimal level of kind of nutritional minerals that these bees are trying to reach. And so the mineral content in those adult bees should be constant over time if they are reaching that optimal level. And it's a little more complicated than that. And you'll see why when we get to that um, data. So what we first had to do to do this experiment was train honeybees to drink from artificial feeders and train them to drink water from artificial feeders, which um, Tom Seeley actually came to visit my site when I was starting the study up. And he was super impressed that I got bees um, to drink water from tubes. So just that alone was enough for me um, as far as making me happy. But like any, you know, any good honeybee, they're not generally motivated by water, they're motivated by sugar, right? So we started with a really concentrated sugar solution right outside my observation hives. Um, and we just had an upside down mason jar. This is a way boat um, from the lab, waited for a lot of bees to find the jar. And then we slowly moved it further and further away from the hives. Um, and you can see why we wanted to train them further away from the hives. Um, at Tufts University, where I did this research, the only place they allowed us to keep stinging insects on campus um, is behind the gym where the facilities are. And so there's all kinds of weird things happening um, behind the gym. There's piles of dirt, piles of cement, weird machinery. Um, and so what I'm doing here is moving this jar with lots of bees on it, slowly um, away from the observation hives and kind of up this hill into a grassy area, just so we could, you know, observe a slightly more natural behavior um, from the bees and not necessarily be in the way of facilities. So this project actually kind of naturally happened um, because my bees were kind of in this weird area with lots of dirty water options. Um, and I had an undergraduate observe a bee drinking from a puddle that was like on a tarp and just kind of gross and stagnant. Um, and she thought the bees were going to get sick but the bees looked completely fine. And I typed into Google, do honeybees like dirty water? And what I found was a bunch of beekeepers asking that question. Um, there are so many blog posts about it, but only one scientific study from 1940 that kind of broke this down, asked this question, but not in the most controlled manner. Um, and so what the 1940 study looked at was honeybee preferences for um, deionized water, uh, cow dung, water from cow dung distillate and water from urine distillate. And what they found is the bees really liked the cow dung distillate. Um, and so what they boiled it down to is 
well, the bees must like dirty water because the cow dung distillate smelled really bad um, and the bees are finding the water via scent. And it could be that they are finding water via, via scent, but that doesn't necessarily answer the question as why are they going to these water sources in the first place? So once I trained my bees to get to where I was going, I broke the dirty water down into single salt solutions. And I'll talk more about those solutions and why I chose them um, shortly. But first, just a note on training honeybees. It's super easy to do in the fall, um, partly because we're in New England in the fall. My sugar water is the best for the bees, right? That's the best option they're going to find. Um, there's goldenrod, there's aster, but I really had not much competition at all. And so training the bees in the fall took about two days. I had eight observation hives. All eight were visiting um, the table that we did our experiment at, like two to three days. In the summer, it wasn't so easy. Um, I had a lot more competition and the bees just weren't super interested in the sugar water. Um, we tried scenting it with different things. That's what Tom Seeley swore by scenting by with anise. Um, didn't really do much as far as the bees finding our jar in the summertime. Um, these are two interns I had, Marlene and Taylor. Marlene was a biomedical engineer. And so what she tried to do, you can kind of see here, is build a duct tape bridge um, for the bees from their little observation hive entrance to the sugar feeder. That obviously did not work. Um, what ended up working is what you can see Taylor doing here is we put little pieces of cardboard or index cards with the sugar water right at the entrance of the hives. And then once enough bees kind of uh, congregated on that sugar and were distracted by drinking sugar, we slowly moved the cardboard um, to the feeder and kind of coaxed them onto the feeder. And then they'd find the feeder and then they'd go home and tell their friends. Um, so this process in the summertime took anywhere from two to three weeks. Um, so we were really, you know, working hard to train these bees. It did eventually work. Um, I also had some students write love notes to the bees. So this one says, bees, please come. Thanks, Sal. Um, but what worked best was, you know, moving the bees physically um, with these cards, which is sometimes on a windy day, could definitely be risky. Marlene always wore the suit. Taylor and I did not wear the suit and generally the bees weren't too upset with us. So once we finally had our bees visiting what we call our tasting table um, and used to feeding from these artificial feeders. So we trained them with a mason jar um, and then we transitioned to these small tubes so we could do different solutions um, at a time. We then did these preference assays. And these assays lasted anywhere from four to six hours, um, any day that was nice outside, basically. So as long as the bees were active, we were outside watching the bees at this tasting table. And at this table, we had a few different solutions. The first two were two control solutions. Um, so we had a sucrose feeder here, just to keep the bees remembering that there was food at this table. Um, so this is what we call our positive control. And as far as comparing our mineralized water solutions, um, we removed sucrose from the analysis. And that'll make sense when I show you the graph in a bit. Um, we also had deionized water. So again, this is water with nothing in it. Um, it's pure H2O. And this is what we call our negative control. So that's what we're comparing everything to. And then we had six different salt solutions, um, all based on what's normally found in dirt, right? So we saw our bees visit, uh, visiting puddles in the mud. So these are all likely to be found in dirt, in mud. Um, and they're also all important for insect nutrition as far as we know. <clears throat> so generally speaking, sodium and potassium are really important for water regulation and pH regulation. Calcium is really important for the hardening of the exoskeleton, um, which is kind of the bees and other insects' first line of defense. It's like our skin. Um, it's also really important for muscle movement, which will be important later in the talk. Um, magnesium is an important cofactor in a lot of immune functions. Nitrogen and phosphorus are important for cell-to-cell -cell communication in the bee um, and insects in general, waste removal, all kinds of different things. So these are six salts um, that bees are likely to find in dirty water and are known to be important for insect nutrition. 
And here you'll see at our tasting table, we have all these tubes. Each tube has one solution in it. And the salt solutions were made with deionized water. So the salt solutions were only water and salt, which is why Tom Seeley was so impressed. I was able to get my bees to drink um, from these tubes, which as beekeepers, we all know they need water to a degree. Um, it's just not as attractive sometimes as that sucrose feeder is. Um, so here, this is what we call our experimental side, the side that's open to the bees to forage from. Um, and the other side is kind of our evaporation control. So what we're measuring here is volume change in each of these tubes. Um, so any volume change in the tube where the bee was allowed to forage minus volume change where the bees were excluded from um, is the actual volume that the bees drank from our tubes during the study. And I had a lot of undergraduates help me with this because not only did we have to watch the setup while we were doing the study, um, we had to make sure only honeybees were drinking from our feeders, right? Because we're doing pure volume change. So anytime we saw a wasp visit, which happened, or a bumblebee visit, um, we had to get up and shoo it away, making sure only our honeybees were drinking from our solutions. Um, and I'm not going to present the data today um, but we also color marked our different hives. So we had eight observation hives. Um, we did this study over three years and each year we had eight brand new observation hives. So all new bees um, and we were able to color mark them. So we could tell which hives were visiting which minerals and which bees, which honeybees might be from other backyard beekeepers or kind of feral. Um, and that was a lot of fun because we had tufts facilities workers know what we were doing with our bees and then they'd report to us like, I saw a pink one over by the gym and an orange one up by the library. So that was a lot of fun. So here's a quick video of one of those preference assays. Um, so you see our tubes here and you'll see um, lots of bees flying around. But what I want you to draw your attention to is the tube in this top right hand corner. You'll see a bee land there and she kind of makes her way down each tube until she decides to drink from um, this bottom right-hand corner tube. So they were definitely kind of sampling as they go. So you can see she's come into the second one here and then our third one, and then down to the fourth one where she decides to drink. And so they were likely taste testing um, either with their feet, because we know they have receptors in their feet or their pr proboscis, um, but either way, they're able to discern the differences between these water solutions, even though I was only using 1% salt solutions, um, which is super cool. So they definitely have this kind of nuanced taste mechanism that we really don't know all that much about. So now here is the data. So I have my six mineral solutions here on the bottom. So sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And what I'm going to show you is preference of each solution in relation to that deionized water. So right here, this bold line, that's our deionized water. Anything above the bold line means the bees preferred it compared to deionized water, and anything below it means they tended to avoid it compared to deionized water. Um, and you'll see we did this in two seasons. Um, so fall is that light gray, summer is the dark gray. And again, we were able to do this um, over three falls and two summers. So we had all different colonies each time. And depending on the season, we had a different number of trials just because there are way more nicer days um, in the summertime to do this in than in the fall. So if we just look at our fall data, um, we can say that honeybees do have preference for mineralized water over deionized water. And they have the strongest preference here for our sodium and potassium. Um, they tend to prefer calcium and magnesium, and they don't really seem to care much about nitrogen and phosphorus. It's kind of the same um, volume drank compared to that deionized, deionized water. So this is the fall. And then in the summer, things shifted a little bit. Um, so we still have this really strong preference for sodium. All of these asterisks mean it's a statistically significant difference, so they really like sodium. But now they're tending to avoid um, pretty much everything else, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus. So in the summertime, they're really only going for sodium 
um, in water. So they're only really drinking the sodium water at our table in the summer. And I want to kind of focus in on these three switches in preferences. So our potassium, our calcium, and magnesium, specifically because there's a 1980 study um, done at the USDA Bill Beltsville B Lab that shows these three minerals are the most commonly found in bee collected pollen and their levels shift throughout the year. So in the fall, there are not a lot of these minerals in, in pollen and the bees are coming to our table to drink the water. In the summertime, however, there are a lot of these minerals in pollen and the bees are not coming to our table to drink the water. So this suggests that they are in fact um, kind of supplementing their floral diet based on the season with different water solutions. So yes, honeybees did show mineral preferences when foraging for water and mineral pre preferences did differ with the distribution and abundance of floral resources, but I'm gonna give this a gray check um, because that 1980 study, like I said, was done at the Beltsville lab. So that's mid-Atlantic region instead of the Northeast region. And as we all know, floral resources differ um, pretty greatly between even you know, one town over in Rhode Island. There might be different sources um, for your bees depending on where you are. And so it looks like mineral preferences are differing with the distribution and abundance of floral resources based on what we know from the mid-Atlantic region in the 80s, but we wanted to know what our bees were actually bringing back to the hive. Um, so what we did, these are the same colonies that were trained to drink from our water tubes. Um, and what we did is we just put a little mesh hardware cloth over the observation hive entrance um, and we collected pollen from the bees. So you can see this bee kind of squeezing in there. Um, and this is six mesh hardware cloth. It was super hard to find. Thankfully, I found a beekeeper that had it. Um, and we put them, put this over the hives just with a little bit of Velcro for an hour, a couple times each week. Um, any, ob any observation hive with a pollen trap, major traffic jam. It was not great. Um, and so we kind of didn't want to subject the bees to that much pollen collection. So we did this a few times a week um, and we collected their pollen from the spring, um, well, the summer into the fall. And what we predicted to happen is that pollen content, bee collected pollen content when it comes to these minerals would completely complement their preferences for water. Um, so this is just kind of a visualization of what I showed you in the graph. Um, so in the summer, they tended to avoid calcium, magnesium, and potassium. And so what we would expect is to see a lot of that in our bees pollen. And they had a huge preference for sodium. So the two up arrows here. So we'd expect lower levels of sodium and pollen in the summer. And then the complete opposite in the fall. So in the fall, they were drinking all of our mineral solutions more than water. So we have all these kind of increased up arrows, again, especially sodium. So we'd expect the complete opposite. So relatively lower levels of all of these minerals in pollen in the fall. And you'll notice now um, phosphorus and nitrogen are missing, missing from my minerals. Um, and that's because the chemical analysis we use to do this pollen assay, um, it's really hard to do nitrogen, nitrogen and phosphorus because of the standards we have to use. Um, and so we just focused on our calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. And doing this analysis, pollen is really hard to work with. Um, any scientist who's worked with pollen will tell you it's a pain in the butt. Um, and what we actually had to do, it's really hard to digest, which is why bees ferment it a little bit. We had to heat it up in a microwave with really strong acid, which is it's an actual scientific method called microwave bomb digestion, which I had a very brave undergraduate work on. Um, so all of the pollen analysis data I'm going to show you today, Luke O'Connor, who was a Tufts undergrad, worked really hard on the protocol for this. So here we have our mean concentration of these four different elements um, or micronutrients or minerals, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium over time on our x-axis here. So we started in mid-July, we ended in late September, and we kind of divided this into summer and fall. 
So if we just look at the summer, um, if we look at this bottom line here, these are our pink points, that's our sodium. Um, there's almost no sodium in the pollen our bees are bringing back to the hive, which is what we expect. Most plants are pretty low in sodium. The next line up here, it's our purple points, that's our potassium. There's a little bit more potassium in pollen. Um, you can see it all kind of peaks here in mid-August, so something's blooming in August that gives them a lot of minerals. Our next is our magnesium, these orange points, a little bit higher, um, and calcium was actually quite high in pollen in the fall, I mean in the summer, excuse me. So that's our top line here. So when we look at the fall data, um, we can see things are a little bit shifted. So we still have sodium way down at the bottom here. There's still almost no sodium in pollen. Um, magnesium is actually a little bit lower in the fall than it was um, mid-summer time. Calcium is actually starting to go up. Um, so we're starting to see more calcium in pollen in the fall. And potassium, there was so much potassium in the pollen that bees are bringing back to the hive. Um, Luke, the undergrad who worked on this, ran this sample many times because he thought it was a mistake he made. Um, but this is an actual measurement of how much potassium is in the pollen the bees are bringing back to the hive. So if we look at this table of my predictions now, we can see that calcium was relatively high in the summertime, as expected. So was magnesium. Potassium was relatively low in the summertime compared to what we saw in the fall. In the fall, we see this huge spike. Um, sodium was super low, just as we expected. Calcium in the fall was higher than we expected it to be. Magnesium was low, like we expected. Potassium in the fall was super, super high, completely unexpected. Um, and again, sodium was really low. And so we have these unexpected results, specifically when we're looking at the fall, it seems like the bees are getting a lot of potassium both from their water sources and from their pollen. And the same can be said for calcium. Um, so I want you to keep that in mind when I start to talk about what's actually in the bees themselves. So I think, yes, mineral preferences do differ with the distribution and abundance of floral resources, but they're not all complete complements like we expected them to be. So there's a little bit more nuance here. Now, what's actually in the adult bees themselves? So again, we expected the bees to kind of need to hit this level of optimal mineral content and that level to stay constant throughout time. So to do this, um, we actually turned our attention away from our observation hives and looked at the mineral content of adult bees in our Langstroth hives, which are kept out um, at the Tufts Vet School. And so these are different colonies of bees, but presumably they're all healthy bees. Um, they're all you know, trying to obtain that optimal level of nutrients, just like our bees um, in Medford. So we visited these hives every week um, from the summer all the way through November. And we sampled bees from each hive, um, focusing on the nurse bees. So only sampling adult bees from that brood area. So these are the young adults we're looking at. And we did the same chemical analysis on the adult bees as we did on the pollen. Um, and so you can see we have these four minerals, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. Um, we have our mean concentration again on our y-axis and our timing on our x-axis. So we went from July through November. Um, and you'll just notice before I even show you any data, the range on the x on the y-axis is way different for these different minerals. Um, so calcium ranges from 5 to 20 parts per million, whereas magnesium ranges from 3.5 to 5.5, 5 5.0 parts per million. And so there's very different levels of these minerals in the bees. And first I will show you magnesium and sodium. There was no constant level of minerals in these bees. They were all over the place. Um, and so this is actually a much more interesting result. Um, this shows us that as the colony kind of life cycle goes on, there may be different minerals that the bees need at different times. So for example, in magnesium, there's a lot of up and down until the end of the fall, and it's kind of steadily going down. And so the winter workers might need have different um, micronutrient or mineral levels than those summer workers. 
For potassium, which was one of our um, unexpected results. So this is one where the bees are getting a lot of potassium from their pollen and from their water in the fall. Um, there's no clear pattern here other than that these potassium levels are really high compared to all the other minerals. Um, so 25 to 40 parts per million. So this suggests that bees just need a lot of potassium um, and they're going to get it from wherever they can. The most interesting result, however, is our calcium um, that bounces up and down a little bit throughout the year. And you can see this huge increase in calcium content of adult bees um, late fall. So again, calcium is one of the minerals bees are getting both from their pollen and from their water. And this suggests that in the fall, they need a lot of calcium. Um, so the really cool thing about this is it lines up really well with the timing of the switch from summer workers to winter workers in the honeybee hive. Um, so Heather Matilla's work from Wellesley, she's shown that the bees start raising winter workers around the end of August, and they'll slowly raise more and more winter workers until the hive is 100% winter workers, and that tends to happen about the last week in October. And so what we see here is likely this huge shift in mineral content um, from those summer workers to the winter workers. So our winter bees likely have way more calcium in them than our summer bees do. And when we think about what our bees are doing in the winter, um, this makes a lot of sense. So in the winter time, our bees cluster around the queen and they actively vibrate their muscles to generate heat. So here we have a thermal image of this cluster and we have our queen in the middle. And I mentioned way at the beginning of the talk that calcium is really important for muscle movement. And so it's likely that the bees are storing this really important mineral for muscle movement in preparation for what they're about to do all winter long, um, which is vibrating their muscles. And we know that honeybees store different levels um, of carbohydrates and protein to get through the winter. Um, so hives that have different levels of carbohydrates stored in their bees are going to be more successful than hives that have lower levels. And so it could be that these minerals are just as important as things like carb, uh, carbohydrates and protein um, for winter success, over winter success. So mineral content of adult bees was not constant over time, but it was a way more interesting result um, than that constant adult bee mineral content. So I'm now at Providence College. This was all research I did at Tufts University. Um, and future research as far as dirty water is concerned, I'm really interested as a professor now to dig into what these minerals or micronutrients mean for overwinter survival. Um, so as we all know, it's really hard to get your bees through the winter um, here in New England. Beekeepers lose bees every single year um, over the winter. And so I'm really interested in, of those colonies that make it through the winter, what minerals are really high in those worker bees, both before and after the winter. Um, so I will dig more into that once I have actual bees on campus and can do some more experimenting. Um, and I'm also super interested in which foragers are actually collecting um, water and these minerals. Are they unemployed pollen foragers or nectar foragers? Um, or are there just bees that specialize in collecting water? Um, there is one paper from the 1950s that followed bees throughout their lifetime, so forager bees throughout their lifetime, and there was one bee in their study who foraged for water her entire foraging career. Um, so in, it's possible that we have bees that are only water foragers, um, and I'm really curious into digging into that more. Um, so once I have hives on campus, we can set up this um, tasting table again, and we can paint mark bees and see which bees return to different feeders and which bees go back to which hive. Um, this spring and summer, I'm doing not super honeybee stuff because I don't have colonies on campus yet. Um, it's been a weird year to be new somewhere. Um, I'm not new to Rhode Island, which has been so useful um, this past year, but I am new to campus. And so meeting the people that'll help make you know, having bees on campus possible has been a little bit more difficult um, this year. So 
this spring and summer, we'll still be doing pollinator research, um, but we're kind of switching our focus to just insect pollinators in general. Um, so on campus, we have these two bio swales, um, which are technically rainwater gardens, but they've been planted with native plants and they're fantastic pollinator resources. Um, so I have an undergraduate who will be working full time on just surveying these bio swales, um, doing behavioral observations of the insects, putting out some bee hotels um, to see what might nest there. And so it's going to be a lot of fun to see what we get on campus. I know we have a ton of honeybees on campus. So at the very least, we'll be observing some bees visiting our bio swales. Um, and then we'll also be doing a similar study looking at bees or insect pollinators um, near Narragansett Bay and seeing how distance from the bay might affect the diversity of insects you're likely to find. Um, so we're hoping to lurk, work with the Westerly Land Trust on this. So it'll be a little bit further from campus, um, but it'll, it'll be a lot of fun to get out. So no honeybee focus research this year, but we're definitely gonna see some honeybees um, as we're doing our surveys. So what does all of this mean for your bees and what can you do for your bees based on what we know about dirty water? Um, first of all, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, um, but honeybee nutrition is important, not just to keep your bees happy and healthy, um, but for our nutrition as well, right? So commercial pollination relies on trucking honeybees around the US and relies on honeybees pollinating these large monocultures. And so if we know what these monocultures are lacking, um, maybe we can inexpensively supplement these monocultures with these kind of salty water sources, right? Because those large, large monocultures, not only are there only almond flowers, for example, but they're using herbicides. They're killing all of the weeds that might give any sort of diversity to the bees. And those herbicides and whatever other pesticides they might be using likely end up in whatever dirty water is on that orchard. Um, and so the bees might be visiting these dirty water sources that are, are kind of laced with chemicals that we don't necessarily want them drinking. Um, I'm also interested in kind of diving deeper into these season specific diet, diet supplements for you know, backyard beekeepers and other managed honeybee hives. If we know calcium is lacking in the environment in the fall, maybe it's easy enough to give those bees a salted water solution. And just in general, I'm really interested in bolstering practices for insect pollinator conservation because with urbanization and land use change, we are getting rid of flowers. Um, and so insect pollinator nutrition really does depend on us um, providing insects with not just flowers, but the right flowers, diverse flowers. So a field like this is going to provide both your honeybees and other insects with a lot more nutrition um, than something like a monoculture. And so even if you're in an urban environment, right, you can still provide your bees with diverse resources. Um, so this is the at Tufts University, the Tufts Pollinator Initiative. We did make Tufts a Bee Campus USA. Um, and this is one of our pollinator gardens. And you can just see quickly, there's a lot of different colors here. Um, so there's a lot of different flowers, a lot of nutritional variety for insects. But what can you do for your bees right now? Um, right now, you can give them a supplemental mineral source, whether that be putting water in your bird bath and letting it become stagnant or um, giving them, you know, some kind of salt lick. Um, so I've talked to beekeepers who now put salt licks out for their bees and the bees do visit them. The only caveat I'll give you is sometimes, for some reason, salt licks have pesticides in them. So you wanna make sure you're not giving your bees a salt lick with pesticides. Um, you can also make a salty water solution just using um, not uniodized salt. I don't know what the iron, iron does to them. Um, I didn't test it. I just tested pure NaCl, which is uniodized salt. You can just do a 1% by volume solution um, and give them at the very least that sodium that we know they're really not getting from their pollen. Um, you can also give them diverse floral sources throughout the year. So I touched on this a little bit. Um, a really great app I love to suggest to people is put out by the Pollinator Partnership called Be Smart. Um, the Pollinator Partnership also has region specific planting guides. And the importance of giving your bees kind of native sources is 
they're one way easier for you to take care of because they're kind of adapted to our New England environment. But also we would just want to keep things as natural as we possibly can. So give your bees diverse native floral sources throughout the year so that when the fall rolls around and they might be lacking things, they're more likely to get stuff from flowers that are blooming. And then the test pollinator initiative, we did a survey last year looking at our gardens and determining which flowers attracted the most insect pollinators. Um, and these were four of our most attractive flowers. And you'll see that they span a range of blue bloom times. So for early spring, foxglove beard tongue was a fantastic resource. Um, in the summertime, Culver's root and cutleaf coneflower were just wild with bees. Um, the, at Providence College, we have a ton of cutleaf coneflower and the honeybees go wild for it in addition to other bees. And then in fall, as expected, um, goldenrod was a fantastic resource. And then as you're all doing tonight, support local beekeepers, farmers, nonprofits, educate people about bees. Um, the Bee Girl uh, has this Kids and Bees handbook available on her website that I think is fantastic um, for getting kids excited about bees and insects. Because if you get kids excited about bees and insects, they're going to go home and tell their parents, don't mow the lawn, keep the dandelions there. Um, and that's always a lot of fun to see. Um, so with that, thank you all for listening and having me. I'm really excited to be back here in Rhode Island doing research and kind of being plugged into the beekeepers here. Um, so I will take any questions now. Also, thanks to everyone who made this research possible. And if you don't have a chance to ask your question tonight or you, come, you think of something later, please feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, you can also find me online and on Twitter as well. Thank you, Rachel. That was a really uh, excellent and in-depth talk. Uh, I always kind of do my own personal vetting of these talks by the amount of questions I take during the talk and then how many are answered before I get a chance to ask them. <laughs> and I have a whole list that I wrote down here and really you got to all of them. So that's uh, awesome. very thorough. Um, th the one thing, I'm not sure I heard you say, and forgive me because when I was muted, I dipped out for a minute to eat uh, dinner. Mm -hmm. uh, the, kind of the basic premise was um, bees preferences for trace minerals. Yep. What is the actual function of trace minerals for the bees? Like, is there a specific um, physiological function that they require calcium or magnesium or phosphorus to you know, say produce brood food or produce wax or what have you? Yeah, so everything we know about the functions of these minerals tends to be kind of just general, why is it important to insects? Um, so there's this like whole volume on insect physiology and nutrition um, that I consulted in choosing these minerals because we don't have a really clear understanding of what they're doing for honeybees specifically. Um, but in insects in general, we know sodium and potassium are important for water regulation within the bee's body, um, as well as pH regulation. Calcium is really important for hardening of the exoskeleton, um, so that kind of outside layer of the bee and other insects, and muscle movement. So just like calcium is important for muscle movement in us, it's important for muscle movement in bees. Um, so flying, clustering over the winter. Um, and then magnesium is important for immune functions generally in insects. Again, it could be doing something else in honeybees in addition to that. Um, and nitrogen and phosphorus are just kind of important for all living organisms, um, whether that be removal of waste from the system or cell to cell communication within the system. And so they all kind of have these like nuanced functions. Um, and I was really excited about the calcium results because we know calcium is important for muscle movement. Um, the other cool thing about calcium, which I didn't mention, is in too large amounts, it can actually cause paralysis. So it can cause your muscles to kind of like stiffen. Um, so that was an interesting thing that I learned when I saw that bees were getting calcium from both my water sources um, and the pollen, but we didn't see any paralysis in our bees. So I suspect the bees at least know what levels they need um, and won't overdo it. 
hopefully. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Ed, did you have questions from the chat for Rachel? Where'd he go? <laughs> Paging Ed. <laughs> yeah, I was muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So there was some general comments and uh, let's see, questions start with, um, so when our neighbors ask us to keep our bees away from their swimming pools, <laughs> does your research give us any suggestions? Should we put sodium chloride in the water sources we create for them? Yeah, um, I would say, yes, keeping bees away from a swimming pool, um, a way to do it is providing them another dirty source um, to visit instead of that swimming pool. So if you put sodium chloride um, in, you know, a feeder, like I said, I use 1% volume. I think pollen has one to 3% volume generally. So I tend to suggest anywhere in that range um, by volume. They will eventually learn that they can get their salty stuff from there instead of the swimming pool, or even just leaving, you know, your bird bath stagnant for a little while, things will develop in there. Um, and the bees will eventually learn that they don't have to go to the swimming pool. I get that one a lot. All right, so along the same line, uh, should we leave a plate of salt water for our hives? Yeah, I mean, I don't think leaving anything for the bees prob isn't going to hurt them, right? If the bees don't want it, they're not gonna go to it. Um, and so I always suggest, you know, putting a 1% salt solution, you're, you're putting a water feeder out for the bees anyway. Um, and so if you just put a little bit of salt in there, then they'll get, you know, both their hydration as well as some minerals from that salt feeder. Uh, most of us, many of us feed solid sugar during the winter. Any thoughts on adding something like a calcium supplement? to the sugar supplement that we feed them. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, the only, I kind of, I'm slower to suggest adding calcium to, you know, sugar because it's just harder to find a, you know, NACL sodium is really easy to find um, for the regular person. Whereas calcium chloride isn't necessarily as easy to find unless you find it um, in a cal uh, salt lick, a special salt lick. And so if you can find those salt licks, I don't, you know, you can mash it up into that solid sugar feed. Um, Honeybee Healthy, I think it is, also has minerals in it as well. Um, and I think calcium's in it. And so one thing I do is just kind of, you know, if you make a candy board, you can add that Honeybee Healthy to your candy board. And I would suggest, especially using that Honeybee Healthy, if you're going to use it as supplemental feeding, into the fall because that seems to be when the bees are kind of lacking minerals in their diet the most. Okay. Uh, would the differences in minerals and pollen also be reflected in the mineral content of honey? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so I didn't address that. Thanks for bringing that up. So any minerals that are found in pollen um, are also going to co-vary with what's found in nectar in that same plant. Um, but pollen tends to have just higher mineral levels than nectar just based on the physiology of the plant. And so they are likely getting some minerals from their nectar and honey, but the most minerals they're getting from their diet um, is going to be from that pollen. But whatever they're getting from pollen, they're also getting in their nectar, just in smaller amounts. Um, so pollen's a pretty good proxy for what they're getting from flowers in general. Uh, let's see, I, I think this one I can boil down to, um, what do you think about bees looking for metal oxides? Yeah, I've gotten that question a few times and there's really not, a ton of research on that just yet. Um, and I haven't really delved into it. There's a little bit about copper and iron and zinc, I think. Um, they are copper, iron, zinc, they are naturally found in pollen. Um, and so if they're looking for those metal oxides, they might just be looking for those different forms of the minerals. Um, 
like I said, there's not too much research on it just yet. Um, so I don't really have much to say other than it could be bees looking for other forms of minerals as well. Okay, a lot of just thank you and positive comments. Uh, what do you think about calcium with vitamin D supplements crushed in fondant? Oh, that's super interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know what vitamin D would do to the bees. Um, I don't know. I would, I'm going to not necessarily suggest it just because I don't know what, what would happen and I don't want to be the one to have told you to do it. And then, you know, something happens to your bees. Um, I would say it's worth a shot if you want to put it in some water outside of the hive. Um, I'm always kind of a proponent of doing the feeding more outside the hive and then the foragers will collect it if they want it. I mean, I guess if it's in the hive, they'll also collect it if they want it. They don't always eat everything that's in their hive, right? Um, so I don't know what vitamin D would do, but if you want to uh, test it out and let me know, just with a caveat, I don't know what would happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. So is the chlorine in the water attracting the bees? So it could be the chlorine. Um, what I found in my research is the chloride bit of the salt. Um, so sodium chloride is table salt. Doesn't really seem to matter much to the bees. Um, and so I don't think it's the chlorine itself, but rather whatever phosphates and sulfates um, are also in the water um, when, you know, when you're treating a pool or, you know, Human, sweaty humans go in the pool. And so there's probably a lot of sodium in there too. Uh, somebody mentioned that the Apple store, App Store says that the Be Smart Pollinator Garden app is not available in the US. Oh no, that's, I had it on my phone until like maybe six months ago. That's new. So if you can't find the Be Smart Pollinator app, sorry, you can't find it. Um, but what you can do instead is go to the Pollinator Partnerships website. I think it's pollinator.org. Um, and they have eco-regional planting guides. So if you just click on the guide um, for the Northeastern US, there's a whole list of flowers to plant for pollinators, which pollinators they can help and when they bloom. Um, so there is a guide online. It's just more reading than the pollinate than the app might have been. Thanks for that tip. I need to take that out of my talk then. Hey, Rachel, yes. um, I remember at the beginning of your talk, you were talking about, uh, I think one of your first experiences seeing bees foraging on dirty water, you, you kind of had this intuitive moment where you said that can't be good for them. So is there a point where the water is too dirty? Yeah. And it, it actually so this isn't is good a for question. Them? This is something I've thought about a lot is there's probably unsafe dirty water, right? So dirty water has all kinds of stuff in it. In addition to minerals, it has microbes, other little insects, you know, larval mosquitoes are in dirty water, um, chemical runoff. And so that's one of the things I'm interested in um, is if we can provide our bees with a safer dirty water source um, that gives them the nutrients they need, maybe we can avoid those kind of unsafe sources. Um, I did some testing on the sources that I saw my bees drink from at Tufts and they didn't seem to be super unsafe as far as we looked at microbes. So we didn't look at any chemicals. Um, nothing weird grew um, in on our plates, but who knows what else is in dirty water that the bees are getting exposed to. And so that's one thing that's really great about giving your bees a salt lick or kind of a salted water solution is you can hopefully they're visiting those salty water solutions instead of a likely or possibly unsafe dirty water solution but hopefully the bees you know if there's something too weird in there they'll stop collecting it but you never know with some of the things that pesticides can do to our bees unfortunately Uh, let's see, Justine, uh, can you comment on the nutrition, nutritional value of summer and winter pollen patties? Yeah, um, that is a great question. At this point in time, I can't really comment on it. It seems like 
based on what I've done, just looking at the ingredients is that we kind of throw everything we think the bees need at them. Um, so even I've done a little bit of protein work and there are 20 amino acids that make up proteins. Bees only need 10 of them from their food, but we just throw all 20 at them um, in different pollen patties. And so one thing I'm interested in um, at Providence College is kind of diving deeper into the chemical makeup of these pollen patties, what minerals are in there, how much um, protein is in there, and you know how much protein do bees actually need versus what we're throwing at them. Um, so as far as pollen patties are concerned, it seems like we're just giving bees everything we think they need, but there's probably some stuff in there that they don't need. Um, that's not to say it's necessarily bad for them. It just might be, you know, a little bit of a waste if there, there's a certain protein in there that they can't really digest. Well, they're just gonna, you know, eat it and then have to leave the hive to get rid of it. So it seems like we're throwing everything at them. Um, but hopefully some of my future research will dig a little deeper into that. Yeah. How about the tannins in stand-in water from oak leaves and pine needles in it? Oh, that's a great question. Um, there's not a ton of research. So tannins um, are a secondary compound and they tend to be something that plants use to protect themselves because they taste bitter. Um, so tannins are actually, if you oversteep your tea and it's really bitter, that's the result of tannins. Bees actually, as far as bitter taste goes, they're not very good at tasting bitter things. Um, and so I don't think they would taste the tannins, but I don't know it, what it might do um, nutritionally to them. Tannins tend to be a protection for plants just because they taste bitter, not necessarily because they do anything um, to the insects. So nicotine, for example, can actually poison insects. Um, that's why plants make it. Tannins are more just like, yuck, this tastes bad. Um, so I'm not sure, that's a great question. I don't know how the bees would react to that. Okay, a couple comments about bees loving the water in the rusty bird baths. Makes sense. Um, and I don't think we have any more questions. Awesome, well, like I said, if you think of anything, um, feel free to reach out to me. I am now, I'm in Greenville, I'm like, five minutes from the library. So I was really excited to find that uh, beekeeping shelf in the library. Um, so I am nearby now, which is really great. All right. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Thank that was a great you for talk. having me. Yeah, we, we hope this is the beginning of an ongoing relationship. Um, I know you and I have emailed a bit um, beyond this talk, but yeah, I mean, any uh, further research that you're you know, planning on doing or that is ongoing, uh, as far as REBA members can go to contribute to that or uh, amplify what you're doing. Awesome. Uh, I mean, we're, we're willing and able, hopefully able, definitely willing. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's the start, right? That's right. where we all, we all begin. Yeah, I would love to work with you further. Um, and I, I do hope that this is the start of many collaborations, uh, both in beekeeping and research down the road. Absolutely. I, I mean, for me personally, bee nutrition, especially as far as what we know about Rhode Island, mm -hmm. like I, I feel like we're so far behind, um, you know, areas that have like a, a more robust kind of agricultural uh, heritage or um, infrastructure to them. Right. Like yeah. if you look up uh, bee forage in Rhode Island, really what we know about it is based on essentially the reportings of one man who coincidentally was the founder of Reba in 1917. And his, yeah. his observations were repeated and repeated and repeated. Um, you know, and I'm not saying that they weren't right, but can't we do a little better in 2021 with all the, you know, the technology and all the, um, you know, opportunities for collaboration that we have versus just one old man standing out <laughs> in a field, making an observation by eye Yep. Um, you know, so it, it's really, a, it's, it's an area that I personally think we could make some strides on, especially because Rhode Island as the smallest state, we can hit the entire state in a way right. that's much easier than like a Texas could, you know, or, you yep. know, a, a much larger state. Um, 
Yeah. So certainly I'm any, anything that we excited. can do in that area, you know, I, yep. I, I'm certainly willing and eager to engage in that. Awesome. Yeah, I look forward to future bee nutrition research um, and meeting all of you in person one day at various meetings, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, here's to that. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. Um, all right. So guys, it's uh, 8.30 now. Uh, happy Mother's Day to all our mothers. Remember to kiss your queens tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, as a final note, I want to say if you hey. have registered your hives already, uh, the link to that is on our website right now. Uh, that is required by law that you register your hives with DEM. It's free. There are no taxes levied for that. Uh, and I encourage you to do so. And with that, I'm going to thank our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Rachel Benoen, once more and bid you all a fond weekend. Good night. Thank you, Rachel. Good night. Thank you.